you guys. All right, thank you, Emily, and thank you, Gail, for uh, helping to do all the back end portion of our member virtual chat. And thank you to all of you, all of our wonderful members that are tuning in this morning, Wednesday morning, for another member virtual chat. We are at the back of the zoo, and we are with our flamboyant flock of flamingos, our Chilean flamingos. And of course, I'm going to introduce Alex again. Alex is one of our animal supervisors here at the Reed Park Zoo. And she is our expert bird, uh, ornithology, avian, <laughs> whatever you want to call her. She knows her birds. So whenever I'm doing a bird episode, um, I always love having Alex here to help make sure that we're giving accurate information. And also she knows what's going on exactly with all of our birds. And let me tell you, when there's a flock of flamingos, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. Yeah, there's a lot of drama in the flamingo world. Yeah, I love flamingos. So we have how many flamingos now? We have 27 Chileans. So 27 mm -hmm. Chilean flamingos. Um, and it's a pretty exciting time. We're going to actually flip, flip the camera over so you guys can see our flock of flamingos. Because, uh, Alex, there's a lot going on right now. It is nesting season and so we have a couple of flamingos that are actually sitting on some nests. Yeah that's absolutely right Jed. So uh, the last few years we haven't really been encouraging the flock to nest because we've kind of reached capacity at this exhibit. Um, so what's really exciting for us is that the new exhibit should be ready this winter um, and that means that we have room for more so we uh, allowed them to nest and basically that just means that we gave them lots and lots of sand mud mix. Um, we have a soaker hose underneath the soil so they can build those beautiful mounds that you see there. Um, and then they kind of do their own thing. Um, they, they're the ones that make those mounds. They use their bills to sort of carve up those little volcano looking things. And then the eggs hopefully go right in the center and that's where they sit. And both males and females sit on those eggs. Right now we have three eggs going. Um, they're, because I think um, they've had a couple of years without nesting, some of them are a little bit uh, forgetful as to how to successfully they're, nest. They're out of practice. Yes. <laughs> they're out of practice. Now, yeah. Alex, these guys, as we said, are Chilean flamingos. They're found in South America, mm -hmm. um, kind of down the tip of South America and along the West Coast. And why do they build these mounds? What's, uh, what use is it uh, for them to have these mounds that go up off the ground? Yeah, well, one is that it keeps the eggs from rolling away. And that's one of the things that can happen um, in our zoo. Um, and so with the nice, beautiful mounds, you've really got this nice, stable place that the egg can, can sit and rest. And when the male and female swap places, it gives the egg some safety that it's not going to roll away. Um, it also sort of helps keep the egg protected because they're going to be nesting in, you know, really sort of flat areas, um, areas that... Uh, predators could get to um, and so by building this mound it sort of gives that egg extra protection you can see that one especially sitting so that mound is perfectly curved to her body um, so that makes sure that the egg is sitting properly that the egg can incubate at exactly the right temperature she's doing a really good job right there yeah and I love that this species both the male and the female sit on the nest um, and that's kind of unique not all bird species have that is that correct? That's absolutely correct so if you joined us last week we talked a little bit about how if you have a male and a female and they both look pretty much the same that's a good indication that they both take turns on the nest. Um, if you've got a male and a female that are drastically different and the male's real beautiful chances are that male is not going to be sitting on the nest. And that's because he's used all his energy to build those beautiful feathers to attract that female. And he's too pretty. He's going to stick out like a sore thumb on that nest. So it's the, the um, you know, more brown colored, more uh, dull colored female that's going to sit on the nest. So you can see, we can't really tell male and female um, apart just by, by looking. Yeah, so let's talk about the coloration of them. Mm -hmm. Obviously, flamingos are known for their iconic pink color. Now, we do have six different species of flamingos that range across the world. Um, we have three that are in South America. We mm -hmm. have our Andean, our James, and our Chilean. Mm -hmm. And then we have two African that are our greater and lesser. And then we also have one that's more North American, which is the Caribbean flamingo. Mm -hmm. Each one, different size, different coloration a little bit but they all have that pink color and they extract that from the food 
Absolutely correct, Jed. So they're going to be eating a lot of crustaceans and a lot of algae, and that algae is going to have, um, they're going to have a chemical in it that helps them turn that pink color. And they've adapted sort of receptors so that when they eat that um, algae or that brine that has the carotenoids in it, they're going to turn pink. And a lot of people ask why our Chilean flamingos aren't that pink, um, because they're thinking of uh, American or Caribbean flamingos that are that super, super pink. Um, but this is what Chileans look like in the wild. For whatever reason, they've adapted just to have, you know, that bright pink on the bottom and the pink um, throughout is a little bit lighter. Um, so each flamingo has sort of adapted to have its own level of pinkness. And that's probably due to whatever they had to eat in the wild. So Chileans probably don't have maybe as much of that, um, as much access to that carotenoid as maybe American flamingos do. And now let's talk a little bit about how they feed. I'm going to try to move this camera over a little bit because we do have one that's in the water kind of exhibiting a little bit of filter feeding. Their bill is designed to filter out, as you said, uh, those crustaceans and that algae uh, because they have kind of like a comb in their bill. Absolutely, yeah. So if you ever get a chance to look very closely, you'll see their bill is actually serrated and inside there's even more serration. Um, and what they'll do is they actually put their heads pretty much upside down to eat. Um, and they're going to take in all the water and then they're going to use those combs to filter through the water for the food that they want. Now we said we have 27 flamingos here and there is a magic number of flamingos to kind of bring out the breeding behavior. Uh, if you don't have enough of them, they don't really get that flock breeding behavior. And so over the last few years, uh, as you said, we have had some successful offspring here. Mm -hmm. And what I love is that the offspring, they are born white. Yes, they're, yes, they're completely white because they haven't gotten a chance to soak up the, those carotenoids. So they're white and a little bit, uh, turn a little bit gray. And uh, it's not until they get older that they turn that pink color. And what's really interesting is that um, the flamingos, especially for the first few days, they actually feed, uh, we call it milk. Um, and it's, a, it's actually crop milk, which it comes from the flamingo parents. Um, and it's got all the nutrition they need. It's got all the antibodies. Um, if you have a hoodstock, you'd call it colostrum. Um, and so those few days are crucial to get that um, crop milk from the parents. And that crop milk is actually bright, bright pink red um, because of what they're eating. So maybe a little bit of a kickstart to their pink coloration mm -hmm. um, as they're going. Now, one of the things that we talked about and that you said is really exciting for our flamingos is we are getting a new home for the flamingos. We are. Um, and this one back here we've had for several decades mm -hmm. and it's done well, but it is missing a couple things that, um, you know, flamingos really need to be successful. And as you said, one of those is limited space. So we haven't been able to really grow our flock because of that. Uh, the new habitat is under construction right now. And I know you are a part of the planning phase for that space. So what are some new additions that we're going to be putting into that new habitat that the flamingos are really going to be able to utilize? So the biggest thing is that they're going to have a shelter. Um, I'm not sure how much they're going to really enjoy the shelter, but we really are happy that we'll be able to offer them um, a space to go when it rains, a place to go when it's chilly. Now, Chilean flamingos are used to really extreme temperatures, um, and so they do fine here in Arizona. The heat doesn't bother them. The cold doesn't bother them. Um, but I am excited to be able to offer them the opportunity to, to get in out of the, the weather if they want to. Another um, thing is that we're going to have the ability to give them lots of different choices of substrate. So they're going to have a grassy area, a sandy area, and then a dedicated muddy area that will um, create every, well, summer really, um, for them to nest. So that'll be exciting for them. And then they're going to have a beautiful pool. Um, it's going to have a fantastic filter system, which we're very excited about. This pond is very difficult to clean. Um, and so that's one of the, the great things that the keepers especially are looking forward to. Um, but it's just gonna be a better layout for them. It's gonna have some, um, a nice flow from the water to the land up to the barn. Um, they're gonna have a little bit more space to, like I said, use that different kinds of substrate. Um, and it's gonna be a little bit more open for them, which really Chileans, um, that's in the wild what they're used to. And one of the things that I love about it is going to be the guest experience mm -hmm. since it is the 
first habitat that guests will see when they enter into our brand new entry plaza. Mm -hmm. You guys are all going to get an opportunity to be greeted by this amazing, beautiful flock of flamingos. Now, I said a flamboyant flock, and that's what it's called when you have a group of, or a flock of flamingos, they are called a flamboyant. Uh, and you can see why, because they are uh, such a beautiful, beautiful animal and an iconic species. Um, and it's one here at Reed Park Zoo that we are involved with uh, keeping them safe and educating people about them through the AZA SAFE program. And I wanna give a little bit of a shout out to one of my uh, viewers, uh, Emily Gofferson contacted me about our flamingos and wanted to know a little bit more. And she was actually doing some great research saying that there's around 200,000 Chilean flamingos. Uh, their numbers are going down. But I love it when our young viewers are getting involved with that message. It truly shows that the reach that the zoo has and the connection that they people make when they come to visit these animals, how powerful that is. Um, Emily, I believe, is uh, maybe nine, ten years old, um, and uh, you know, for such a young viewer to already be passionate about this species is amazing. Now, we are one of the, the directors of the SAFE program for flamingos. Talk a little bit about that. So SAFE stands for Saving Animals from Extinction. There are lots of SAFE groups out there, um, and we were very happy uh, to help uh, form this one for flamingos. And it is uh, focused on all the South American flamingos. Um, the Jameses especially uh, is very endangered. Um, and so what we're doing is we're working with researchers um, in the area where they're native. They're doing um, some telemetry tracking and uh, trying to figure out exactly what the numbers are. You said your um, friend Emily did that great research to find 200,000 and that's a great number. We want to know a little bit more exact. <laughs> yeah, because it does change quite yes, often. I does. mean, And there are so many of them, it may be hard to really mm -hmm. narrow that down. Um, and we have chicks that are born throughout the season, and then some of them may not make it, some of them do make it. Um, and so really getting a great number on how many of this species uh, there are, and then really what are the threats that are troubling the species, and then how can we mitigate that? How can we maybe solve some of those challenges uh, that flamingos face so that their numbers uh, don't decline, but continue to become stable and actually increase. Yeah. So do we know what some of those threats are that face flamingos? Right, so the biggest one is habitat loss. And so that's where tracking the flamingos comes into being very important. If we can know what land they're utilizing, we can work with the governments there to protect that land. One of the reasons people want to use the land is that's where we find lithium. And so your phone batteries, your electric car batteries, all of that is going to be coming from the area where these flamingos live. Um, and unfortunately, in order to mine it, the flamingos can't use that land anymore. Um, so one of the things we're working with is to figure out, like I said, where the flamingos are. Can we protect that land? Um, can we set aside some uh, similar land? So the plane going overhead. Sorry, guys, yeah, the plane going overhead if you're getting that background noise. As all of you know that have been to the zoo, we are in the flight path of davis Monthan. So when one of our planes flies over, it uh, kind of uh, takes over our audio. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really important for us to be able to determine that because, mm -hmm. you know, our technology is increasing. As you said, those lithium batteries, they're almost in everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to find a better way to work with the environment and with the needs of humans uh, so that we have a win-win situation. And that can be a little bit challenging. It can, Jed. It's very expensive right now to recycle lithium batteries. Um, I know, you know, most people know when you, you get your new phone, you drop off your old phone and they tell you they recycle it. But yes, it's very expensive um, and it's actually cheaper right now to go get more lithium. So uh, we also need to put some pressure on the tech industries um, so that we can find better ways to recycle our batteries. And then also, I mean, consumers as well. You know, um, do you really need that brand new iPhone? Is your old iPhone working just fine? Um, you might want to think of that before you upgrade, you know, the where that lithium and all those materials are coming from. Yeah, and that's great because I don't think everyone understands or even knows mm -hmm. that um, this is a challenge for uh, a lot of the animals, these lithium batteries. Mm -hmm. So maybe let's think twice before we go just buy the newest 
item that's out there. Uh, and I, let's put pressure on these organizations uh, to figure out how can we recycle these so that we're not just going and mining more lithium. Uh, and these are things that zoos are on the front line mm -hmm. and one, being able to teach people like all you guys today uh, learning about this. Uh, and then we are also a voice in a movement to make laws. Um, and that's huge. And that's where the zoos really play a huge role in connecting all animals here that we uh, take care of with their wild counterparts. Um, and all this would be po wouldn't be possible without all of our guests, uh, like our members, like our amazing members that are out there. Uh, you guys are some of our biggest advocates, our biggest voices, and uh, it makes it all worth it when they get to come in and learn this and then they can go out and even tell that story to a larger audience. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about how we care for flamingos because we do get a lot of people that ask, uh, flamingos can fly, mm -hmm. uh, it's a large body bird, but they can still fly. So why don't our flamingos fly away? And how do we care for a large flock like this if we did have uh, a bird that was maybe injured or one that we needed to medicate? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so there's a couple of reasons that the flamingos don't fly away. One is this is where all their friends are. This is where their food is. They really have no reason to leave. Um, flamingos fly in the wild in order to find new food sources or to find suitable areas to nest. Um, and so because we provide all of that, um, they don't need to go anywhere. Um, some of our flamingos are what we call pinioned, which means they've had, when they were baby babies, they've had the very tip of their wing taken off. Um, so that they don't fly away. Um, what's exciting for me um, in the new exhibit, because we're going to have that shelter, we won't have to do that anymore. We'll be able to take the flamingos um, in uh, to the barn every year. Um, so if we do have some chicks, we'll just be able to trim a couple wing feathers. Um, so that is exciting for me. And um, when you trim the wing feathers, <laughs> the bird feels a little bit off balance and doesn't want to fly. That's right. Um, and it's a little bit awkward. So mm -hmm. therefore, it's a really easy way uh, to make sure that our birds aren't flying into a dangerous area. Mm -hmm. uh, we are next to 22nd Street. Yep. We are next to a park. We don't want them to get injured. Mm -hmm. So this is a really easy way to keep them safe right here in our habitat. Yep, absolutely. Um, and so another exciting thing, you were talking about doing medical um, things with our birds if we needed to catch someone up. So right now um, we get in waders and we go and catch the bird that we need. Um, if we needed to take him to the health center, we have a special aquatic room there. And we always take a friend, at least one friend, because they are very social animals. They would feel, um, you know, they feel much more comfortable if there's a group. And so we would take at least one to be their friend. Um, again, with the new exhibit, we'll be able to um, section off that shelter, the um, back area. And if anybody needed to be, um, cared for very uh, specifically, they'd be able to be in that shelter. They'd have the ability to see the flock. They'd still be with a friend. Um, and so that's another reason I'm excited about that new shelter. Um, it's really amazing. So we're looking at all these birds and there are some differences between them, height and things, but very difficult to tell apart. Um, and my keepers do an amazing job of keeping track of um, who is friends with who and and, and I, I, I love that you're saying who's friends with who. Now, <laughs> we actually are looking at number 17 right here. So we have identifying markers. These are little bracelets that we do put on so that it is easy for us to spot them um, and identify if something is going on where we don't have to get very invasive. So each one has their own ID. Is mm -hmm. that correct? That is correct. Yep. And um, they all have names as well. Yeah, so, so let's talk about the drama of a flamingo <laughs> flock. I mean, this, this could be a soap opera. Okay. I love coming up here and hanging out in this area because look at these two right here. Yeah. Uh, let me see there. Uh, it, it seems like everything is fine. And then all of a sudden we start squawking. We get our feathers ruffled. Um, there's a little conversation that happens between each other. I mean, it's a, it's a full on drama being played out. It absolutely is. And, and nesting season brings it out, especially um, you know, there's jockeying for the best nest position. I'm not sure what makes the best nest because some of the nests I think look beautiful aren't used, but <laughs> so whatever they think makes the best nest, they, they jockey for position. Um, once one uh, mate is sitting, the other one usually stands next to it and tries to keep all the others away. Um, we have one flamingo who likes to sit on things that aren't eggs. Um, so she will, <laughs> she will sit on things and, and other oh, flamingos want to be there. Um, and then sometimes we have some mate switches. Usually flamingos will stay with the same mate 
um, for most of their lives unless they're not successful and then they might switch. But every once in a while I see some together and I think that's not who you're supposed to be with. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I love it. If there was a soap opera uh, on animals, I think the flamingos would be the stars. Yeah. Uh, it just, I, I wish we spoke flamingo to see what or to hear what some of these guys were talking about because uh, it does just seem like there's a lot of commotion there's a lot of stuff going on and just w while we've been standing here hopefully you guys are getting to hear the audio of the flamingos chattering and uh, some of that amazing interaction that we're talking about <laughs> yes that, there he is. He's, he's honking at us um, yeah, that was definitely directed at you, Jed. <laughs> yes. Very clear. <laughs> now, your keepers, as you said, each one has na their own name. Um, and I'm assuming they also have personality. So uh, is there some that, you know, like to get closer or are a little bit more territorial? Yes. Yeah, so uh, we do have one that was um, mostly hand reared. And so she, um, she's the one who will come up to you sometimes. Although right now during nesting season, she seems to have sort of stayed away. But yeah, she's much more friendly. You can get pretty close to her. Um, some are more territorial. These three with the, with the nests, those are definitely the most territorial right now. Um, it's amazing. So usually when you go out on the island, they're pretty wary of you. They don't want to really be near you. Um, but if you move slowly, you know, you can get relatively close, but they're so focused on their eggs. You can walk right up to them nowadays and, and they just don't, oh, you don't see me, I'm on my egg, nothing to see here. Um, so that's pretty amazing. Um, and then we've got some that are- Hold on, plane flying over. Oh, there's me. There you guys go. So, we, I was waiting for one of those guys to stand up. Uh, sorry, guys. Uh, the planes were flying over. There's no point for us to talk as those planes were going. Um, so, yeah, now that uh, one stood up here, uh, we can actually see the size of the egg. And uh, we were doing a little test earlier, and Emily was saying uh, that they, the, the eggs are pretty big. They are. It's a good size egg. Yeah, it's a good size egg. I'd say it's about four times the size of a chicken egg. Um, it takes about a month to hatch. Um, that's our newest egg. It was just laid either last night or early this morning. So brand new egg out there, guys. Mm -hmm. You guys are seeing. And that's an experienced flamingo who's had chicks before. Um, so we're excited, especially about that one. Uh, she actually laid earlier this year and the egg was not fertile, so it didn't hatch. And so she's trying again. We're hoping to have better luck this time. Now, not all the eggs do hatch a chick. So sometimes um, either temperature, either it wasn't a fertile egg, um, whatever the situation is, not all these eggs are going to produce chicks. And so that's something that you guys do monitor. Uh, every day your keepers will come out. We saw Hannah right before we got on here. Our zookeeper was coming out to just assess and see what's going on. And she was able to see that we have that egg. So sometimes we do, if it's beyond that incubation period, we do pull it, we do a candling mm -hmm. and um, then, uh, you know, we'll dispose of that egg if it's not fertile. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. And that's um, simply because one, they sit for a very long time, and that's a lot of energy because they sit half the day, the other one sits half the day, it's half the day they're not eating. Um, and then also we would like for her to have a fertile egg. So if we can take that infertile egg away, the likelihood that she's gonna play again increases. And that's exactly what happened here. So <laughs> yep. time clock starts again. Um, uh, as you said, this is a brand new egg that you guys just saw right there. So we'll see potentially in a month if maybe we have a chick. Sometimes we, um, you know, we'll have uh, chicks and sometimes we have seasons where we don't have any. Now we did say breeding season. So does that happen once, uh, once a year? It does happen once a year, yes. And so these flamingos are a little bit funny to me. So um, I've worked at several institutions that have had flamingos and normally they breed in, in sort of the spring. Uh, these guys choose to breed now. <laughs> and so what's, what's a little bit funny is that I, I'm, I, when I first started, I said, well, it's going to get cold. And first of all, it's Arizona. It doesn't get that cold. doesn't get that cold, yes. <laughs> As we know. <laughs> um, and they said, that everybody assured me, no, no, they do fine. One hatched on Thanksgiving one year. Yep. His name is Cranberry. Uh -huh. they, they do just fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So we did have one question out there I saw come through. Do we know the male to female ratio of our flock? Yes, we have um, three 
extra females, basically. Um, so when you uh, have your flocks, you want to have a pretty even um, sex ratio is what we call it. Um, it's better to have, if you can't, it's better to have more females than males. If you have too many males, your likelihood of um, having successful breeding goes down. And that's simply because um, the males are constantly jockeying for those females. They don't have a chance to form those really strong pair bonds. Um, so we have three extra females right now. Um, and so there's a possibility in the future we may um, either bring more males in or send some, some girls out. Um, because there are other institutions that are a little bit male heavy that would like some more girls. And this goes right back to the soap opera of the flamingo <laughs> yes, world. Um, you have to have that right ratio. You have to have the right number of flamingos. Yeah. Um, if you don't have any of those things, you know, it's, it's so funny. There's such particular birds. Mm -hmm. um, I love it. I, I love the whole dynamics of what the flock brings and being able to sit back and observe it in this setting um, is really great. So Emily, I want to turn it over to you and just see, um, I saw that one question that came through, but um, do, you, do we have any other questions? Yeah, uh, we have quite a few questions actually. Um, so we know that their breeding season is about once a year, but how often would they lay eggs if, uh, you know, we kept taking away the infertile eggs, how many eggs could they lay in a season? Oh gosh, so we, we would not want to test that. Um, it's incredibly energy uh, high thing to lay an egg. Um, I would say I wouldn't want a flamingo to lay, you know, two eggs I think I'm comfortable with, three eggs is probably pushing it. Um, in the wild, that's probably, they're not going to get a chance to re-nest um, just because the time period that they can nest in the wild is going to be much shorter because of food supply and things like that. Um, so I'm, I'm fine with her trying again with that second egg. Um, if we've discovered that egg is infertile, we're just going to let her sit on it. Um, and then by then it'll, it'll be the end of the season and she won't relay. And those eggs that are infertile, we can just dispose of them. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing special that happens. I think I saw a question come across that somebody was asking, what do we do with the eggs? Um, it's an infertile egg, so there's nothing going on with it. We can just dispose of it. Yeah. Um, Once they've sat on it for 30 days, um, you aren't going to want to do anything with that yes, egg. <laughs> yeah, yeah they, they can get actually pretty rotten <laughs> inside. Um, and again, that's something that, you know, we don't want the flamingos out there to have to deal with. Um, we have the ability to remove that and um, as Alex said we uh, can get another egg or um, if we wanted her to you know not to lay any more we could actually substitute that for what we call dummy egg um, so we do have some fake eggs that we could put in there um, that they do believe that they're sitting on so that's also another um, variable that we that we have as, as uh, something we can do mm -hmm. um, all right Emily you have another question sure uh, do flamingos swim like ducks not like ducks because their feet, because they're so far down on those long legs, um, they are not very good at paddling. Um, but they can swim, yep, and um, they, will, they will still use their legs to sort of push themselves around. They're just not very um, graceful at it like a duck or a swan. And you guys can see those pink joints right there that um, they're bending their leg at. Uh, this species is known for having that pink joints. The, the other species don't. So it's one of the identifying markers of the Chilean flamingo. Also, they do tend to have more black on their bill um, than on several of the other species. Um, and out of the six species, this is a fairly large one. Yes, uh, I would say it's the, probably the third largest because the greater African and the Caribbean are going to be larger, but okay, this is so, pretty big. Yeah, yeah, so it's a it's a fairly large species mm -hmm. um, of flamingo, and um, as we talked about, very colorful. Do we have another question, Emily? Uh, yeah, related to um, how they're a fairly large species of flamingo. Uh, about how tall are they? Uh, so when they stand up straight, these birds are probably just about four feet. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's about right. Yeah, and sometimes you do have to catch them up. We talked a little bit of that for veterinary mm -hmm. um, work, and we do annual physicals on them as well. Yes. Uh, birds do require vaccinations. Yes. I think sometimes people don't realize that uh, birds require vaccines. They're, sometimes they're different than our uh, mammals, but every year we do a full physical on each one. And uh, grabbing a hold of these guys, they're, they're pretty tall. Yeah. Uh, they don't weigh a lot. <laughs> no. 
uh, but they're very tall and uh, they can be a little clumsy as well. Absolutely. So one of the things you have to worry about when you're catching a flamingo is those legs because if they um, are going to try to kick and you don't want them to kick anything and hit anything because there's a danger they could break that leg. So the first thing you do is you give them a hug and then you lift them up real quick so that their legs are off the ground. Um, and then you're going to need a second person to come in and help you secure the legs and the head because we talked about how they're filter feeders so it's not a if they bite you it's not a bad bite but it is a serrated bite so it's not pleasant, it's not pleasant. <laughs> um, and uh, those legs uh, allow them to keep their body out of the water and keep it a little bit cooler because some of the areas that these animals do live in can be very warm on the ground and that's why those legs are as thin as they are because they really don't absorb a lot of the outside temperature so they have those uh, flat webbed feet as we were talking about not really for swimming like a duck does uh, but really to be able to not sink into the ground remember these guys are found on salt flat and soda fields uh, soda flat areas um, estuaries, so not really deep water. So that helps to distribute their weight so that they don't sink down in the mud. And those long legs help keep their body out of the water, which can sometimes be warm. Um, so it's a really great adaptation, but it is one when you're trying to do a veterinary procedure, you do have to be careful about those legs because they are pretty thin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one other cool thing about their legs, so. And most waterfowl also have this, um, their blood flow goes in such a way that the warm water will go through their legs and then when the water gets colder, it will return to the heart and get warmed up. So a lot of people ask, how can they be in cold water or hot water, like Jed mentioned? And that's why, because the way that their circulatory system works, it's always sending out the warm water uh, or the warm blood and collecting the cooler blood in the cold months, um, to keeping, that, keeping those legs warm. Um, and then, as Jed mentioned, they're very thin, so that process has to be very fast. Oh, and you were talking about vaccines. Yeah, so birds don't get your typical pet vaccines or people vaccines. Um, birds don't get rabies, so we don't need to vaccinate them for that. But one of the things we do vaccinate them for um, is uh, West Nile and equine encephalitis. Um, those are two things that have come through the United States in the last few years that um, we have found birds are very susceptible to humans as well, but um, birds seem to be more susceptible, yeah. And our new habitat will allow that catch up to be a little bit easier. Absolutely. That's one of the things that I know we were thinking about when yeah. we were doing construction yeah. on um, let's create an area that makes it safer for the birds and mm -hmm. for us uh, if we needed to do any veterinary care on them or those catch-ups. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, I know, one of the great features about that new habitat. Yeah, it's going to have, um, I designed it so that we're going to have, instead of having rooms in it, it's going to all be open, but then you're going to be able to hang tarps. And so those tarps are going to, if you have to section on and off, you can do that, but also those tarps are going to enable us to have a group and then funnel the group down so then we can have one flamingo, we can catch that flamingo, do what we need to do, and then release her. We're also think, um, talking about having a shoot system where we could get weights as the flamingos go by and um, a mirror system so that as the flamingos step, they would step on this, on the scale, which would have a plexi top with a mirror on the bottom. And so we would actually be able to look at the feet as the flamingos go by. One of the things that can happen with flamingos is they can um, have problems with their feet. Um, these guys here, luckily, we've never had any issues. The, that's the one great thing about this habitat, it's perfect for their feet. So I'm trying to replicate that part in the new exhibit. Um, yeah, so we're really excited about being able to take such much, you know, just better care. We, we take great care of our animals and we take every opportunity to, uh, to try to improve. And all the things you may not think about when you are building a flamingo habitat, uh, but I love to hear all those details and things that we have thought about. Uh, now that flamingo habitat, we are looking to be done and complete and flamingos moved in by the middle of December, first of the year. So all of our members, please stay tuned don't worry, we will be giving you updates on construction on and when that move is going to happen. Uh, Emily, do we have some more questions? We have quite a few questions about uh, flamingo behavior. Uh, so our first one was when that one flamingo stood up off of her nest and was kind of looking at or sort of nudging the egg. Uh, what was that all about? It could be a few things. Um, the birds are able to tell if the eggs are fertile. Um, and so she could be kind of testing it um, to see if that was one of the cases. So that one that egg's a little bit too early for that. Um, but one other thing she could be doing is checking the temperature of the egg, seeing if she likes the way it feels. 
um, seeing if maybe she needs to add more dirt to that mound or um, she needs to reposition it under herself. Um, it's really amazing The science right now, the, they're studying them, the fact that they think the birds can communicate to their chicks through the egg. Um, this, the weather that the egg experiences um, can determine um, you know, different characteristics about the chicks. So the, the more we learn, it's just fascinating what can happen between that, that parent and that egg. And Emily, you must have some flamingo ESP going on because you asked that question <laughs> right as uh, she was standing up and gave us another look at that egg, which gave a perfect opportunity. It's almost like we planned that. Uh, we, we'll just say that we did because we're that good, but uh, you know, uh, some chance and some luck there goes in too. So great work, Emily. <laughs> And um, so keeping on with that behavior uh, line of questions, um, the two flamingos that were sitting on the nest, they sort of started uh, pecking at each other. Was that a hierarchy or what, what was that? It uh, could be a couple different things. Um, it could be that, you know, he, he was asking, is it time to switch? Are you tired? Do you want me to, to take my turn? And she's saying, no, I'm good, go away. Um, I don't recall which exactly when that happened, um, but that could be, it also could be um, another flamingo who wasn't part of the group saying, hey, what are you doing? What's going on? Can I sit there? And she's saying, no, this is my spot. Go away. Um, so it could be a few, few different things. The flamingo drama. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, and then we have another question. Uh, we watched two flamingos in the back raise their back feathers. Is this a territorial display? Um, it could be, uh, there's a couple of reasons that they'll, that they'll do that. Um, one is yes, they're, they're either territorial or just one said something to the other that they didn't like. Um, and so they'll kind of fluff up their feathers to look big. Um, another thing that they'll do sometimes is they'll just fluff up their feathers because they're preening. Um, a lot of times a behavior will go from a couple in the flock and spread through the flock. So you'll see one start to preen and then a lot of them will start to preen or one will start to sleep and the rest will start to sleep. But it sounds like what you were describing was um, a little bit of a, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of here. This is my area. Just making sure you see me kind of thing. Yeah. So you're telling us that it's the flamingos do the wave. <laughs> so remember when we were all back in a stadium, it was crowded and a bunch of people and one person started throwing their hands up and everybody else said, flamingos do the wave. How, you know, I tell you. <laughs> The amazement of the flamingo just never ends. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, how do we feed the flock and uh, what do we feed them? Yeah, that's a great question because we talked about that they eat crustaceans and algae, mm -hmm. uh, but we feed them something very different here. We do. We feed them a, it's a, it's a pellet. Um, so, you know, you get our dog food, we get our flamingo food. Um, it has everything they need as far as minerals and vitamins, and it also has that coloration in it so they can keep their pink color. Um, it's a pellet and we soak it in water. We float it in water, really. So when it breaks down, the flamingos get to do that filter feeding. And so we try to give them the same natural behavior. Um, so we feed them in elevated tubs right now. Um, so they still get to put their heads down um, uh, like they would in the wild. And the reason we elevate them right now for us is because we don't want to be feeding the wild ducks or we at least try not to feed the wild ducks. One of the things that's exciting in the new habitat is they're going to have a feeding pool, which will have feeders on the ground. Um, they'll be hopefully uh, feeders the ducks will not like. Um, and so the flamingos will be able to eat even more naturally. And I just see a heron helping himself as well. So. <laughs> well, and we talk about those exclusion feeders. Uh, we said earlier, why don't the flamingos fly away mm -hmm. um, and go somewhere else? And you said, well, they have everything they need right here. They have all their buddies. They have all their food. They have all their resources. And we do have a lot of our native wildlife that does come in. And we have to be careful about that because those native wildlife, one, their numbers can get huge. And also, they can bring in foreign disease. Mm -hmm. that our birds can be susceptible to. Right, yeah, so um, there's a thing called avian pox that birds can bring in. Um, lots of birds will create uh, problems with the water. Uh, we can get botulism, and so we truly try to limit um, feeding them. Also, you know, they're wild birds. Um, they need to migrate. They need to find, you know, learn to be wild birds, and um, it, we really do them a disservice if, if we're um, feeding them here. And, you know, of course, our exhibit's going to change. So we've had a lot of conversations about the ducks that are here 
that seem to rely on us and what we're going to do with them. Um, so it's, it's a very tricky situation. Yeah, it's, it's best as much as we can exclude them is, is best. Yeah, so one thing for you guys to keep in mind when you are out observing wildlife, um, it's never a good idea to be putting food out um, because then if that food source stops, uh, those animals have learned to rely on it. Uh, or if something changes, maybe you move somewhere, uh, you know, then those animals are kind of left there. So as Alex said, you know, when we do move the flamingos, we will have to keep an eye on some of our ducks that have uh, made their home here. And mm -hmm. we will have to make sure that that transition is good for them also. Yeah, you also create, you can inadvertently create some aggression because they start to learn that people mean food. And then they start to approach guests. We've had a couple we've had to relocate exactly because of that. So it's just, yeah, it's just best to try to try to let them be wild animals. And birds are one thing, but that goes really across the board with any of our wild animals. Uh, we have two grizzly bears here at our zoo mm -hmm. that are here at our zoo because of that reason, because people were feeding them um, in Yellowstone National Park, just outside the Flathead Indian Reservation. And they did get used to that. And then they start seeking humans out. And it's one thing if a flamingo or a duck um, is looking <laughs> for you for food, but when a grizzly bear is, um, now we have a, a real risk of harm to humans. And so in those situations, unfortunately, the animal is usually the one that has to get relocated um, or even sometimes put down. So good message here for all of us when we're working with wildlife um, to just observe wildlife and let wildlife be wildlife because that's going to be the best for you and for them. Sorry, Emily, we uh, kind of diverted there, but I think it was a good uh, opportunity to deliver that uh, great message that we try to talk about here at the zoo. Definitely. Um, thank you for sharing that. And we do have a few more questions. Um, let's see. Do they usually nest so close to each other and would they nest this close in the wild? Yes, absolutely they would. Uh, one of the things that the reason they like being and we mentioned they need a certain number of birds and things like that is because this is how they keep safe. Um, being in a group, they are more likely to spot a predator if it's coming. Um, also in the wild, especially the resources are going to be limited and they're going to be in sort of one area. So they all have to um, manage to use those resources. So yes, this is absolutely something that you would see in the wild this close together. And if you saw those two, she was when she was sitting down. She got a kind of an earful from the neighbor saying, hey, you're disturbing me. And it's like, I'm just sitting, I'm just sitting. <laughs> yeah, so what are these guys' as predators um, and who do they have to look out for? I mean, one, um, it's the eggs on the ground, but then the chicks are extreme, extremely vulnerable as well. Um, we have some more drama going on here. We have uh, our breeding birds. So as we said, breeding season. So uh, we've got breeding going on. We've got nesting going on. We've got talking going on. It's a, it's a full soap opera here, I tell you. Um, so going back to that, who are the, the predators that these guys may have to look out for? Yeah, any kind of little land mammal um, can sneak into the colony and, and grab eggs or chicks. Um, birds of prey, um, those are gonna be something to watch out for as well. So really that's coming from the sky and from the land. So the adults, uh, you know, once they're an adult, they don't have to worry too much about the predators, right. but definitely the eggs and the smaller chicks mm -hmm. um, are highly susceptible to that. So, um, all right, Emily, you got another one. Are they related at all to cranes or storks? Uh, no. Um, yeah, that's, it's interesting the way we talked a little bit last week too about convergent evolution and how because you have the same needs in different places you're going to get similar characteristics like the long legs um but no they're they're not related um very very different as far as their feet structure their feet the way they feed their food um so yeah but good question it's it's interesting though that those long legs were advantageous here for one reason advantageous somewhere else for another reason so you're going to see that same kind of um, an adaptation, but for, for different reasons. Convergent evolution. I love it. Uh, I think that, uh, oh, I have one more. Um, so to compare flamingo legs to our legs, uh, mm -hmm. what joint would be considered their ankle versus their knee? Yeah, so you actually cannot really see their knee joint. It's way up in their body. Um, so what you're looking at in the middle, what we would think would be the knee, is actually the ankle. 
And then that whole section there is the first part of the foot. And what they walk on, you can think of just walking on your very, very tip, tip toes. Um, so a lot of people think their knees go backwards. It's actually, that's, that's actually their ankle. Their knees and hips are tucked way up in their body. And that's the, that's the rule for, for most birds. Yeah, I think actually all birds. Love the skeletal structure of birds. Very cool. Yeah. And then last, last question. Uh, did they <laughs> ever lay more than one egg at a time? Uh, this species, no, no. Awesome. Well, I think that uh, covered um, everything today. Uh, this camera looks fantastic. We got to see some great behavior. Um, do you guys have any last parting facts, words, anything for us today, Jed, Alex? Just want to thank you guys all again for hanging out with us for another Wednesday member virtual chats. I think we're upwards of like 20 of these now. We are making our rounds around the whole zoo. Today was awesome to have Alex again. Thank you Thanks. for coming out and hanging out with us and all the amazing flamingo facts. Um, this is one of my favorite species that we have here at the zoo. And I'm so excited that we are going to be building a new habitat for them and for you guys to get an opportunity to see them when they first come into the zoo. Uh, so with that, I will tell you again, next Wednesday, we have another exciting chat. That's going to be with our black and white rough lemurs. And we've got exciting news about a conservation chat that we're going to be doing on Friday, October 30th with a lemur conservationist, Dr. Stacy Teacott, who in partnership with the University of Arizona and her LEAP lab. So um, I'm gonna be gone next week, so don't worry. I have an amazing person that's gonna be standing in for me. Kristen is on our education team. She is fabulous. You guys are gonna love her. She will be catching up with Hannah, one of our black and white rough lemur keepers, and learning all about that amazing and critically endangered species. Uh, and then I will be back the following week. So make sure to tune in next week. And for today, goodbye. Thank you for hanging out with us. And stay safe, Tucson. <laughs>